Slavery in colonial America commenced in 1640 in the Jamestown colony of Virginia, where white English settlers began enslaving Africans. However, the practice had already been established before this date, with Native Americans being enslaved and deported. Even though the first Africans arrived in Virginia in 1619, chattel slavery was not institutionalized at that time. Reports from Jamestown as early as 1610 mention the enslavement of Native Americans and the Pequot Wars in the New England colonies resulted in colonial victory and the enslavement and deportation of Pequot tribe members. While institutionalized chattel slavery did not become policy in Virginia until the 1660s, the concept and practice were well established, influenced by the Spanish and Portuguese who introduced it before the English arrived. Slavery in the Americas was practiced by indigenous tribes, capturing individuals in raids, wars, or trade, but there was no formal slave trade. Institutionalized chattel slavery emerged after Christopher Columbus's arrival in 1492, developed by the Spanish and Portuguese by 1500, and integral to their colonial economies by 1519. As the English colonized North America, slavery became institutionalized and race-based. Native American slaves were often sold to West Indies plantation owners, while African slaves were part of the triangle trade between Europe, West Africa, and the Americas. Every English colony held slaves, with variations in the lives of the enslaved. Some colonies, like Pennsylvania, objected to slavery, yet citizens still kept slaves. The abolitionist movement gained momentum leading up to the American War of Independence, but concerted efforts to abolish slavery occurred in the 19th century. The Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 freed slaves in Confederate States, and the 13th Amendment in 1865 abolished slavery in the United States, although the impact of racial slavery persisted in American culture. Columbus played a significant role in the exploitation of people in the Americas. On his voyages, he kidnapped natives and, lacking gold, offered them as slaves to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Despite the outlawing of slavery in Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella legalized slavery and the encomienda system in their New World colonies. Columbus established the encomienda system between 1493 to 1496, where Spanish settlers received land worked by enslaved natives. The slave trade, initiated by Columbus, rapidly developed with Spanish, Dutch, Portuguese and French involvement. The enslavement of indigenous peoples persisted in the West Indies, South and Central America throughout the 16th century, while the French and Dutch engaged in the slave trade in the South, building alliances with natives to the North. The English introduced slavery to the Americas in the colony of Virginia, first enslaving Native Americans in 1610 and Africans between 1640 and 1660. As the English set their sights on North America in 1585, the slave trade became just another facet of their colonization efforts, viewed as a straightforward import-export business. The early settlers of Jamestown saw the Powhatan Confederacy's natives as a resource ripe for exploitation. Captain John Smith recounts tales of colonists pilfering from the natives, and by 1610, reports suggest that natives were already being taken as slaves. In 1619, a Dutch ship, seeking supplies, arrived at Jamestown carrying 20 or 21 enslaved Africans. Governor Yardley traded supplies for these individuals, though they were initially regarded as indentured servants, not slaves. The Dutch ship, not originally bound for Jamestown, was forced to dock due to shortages. While slavery might have taken root in the English colonies regardless, this event marked the arrival of the first unwilling Africans as servants to English landowners. Despite being initially indentured, these Africans worked for four to seven years before receiving their own land, following the indentured servitude policy. One such individual, later known as Anthony Johnson, even appeared as a freeman in the census prior to 1640 and eventually owned a slave named John Cassar. However, in 1640, a turning point occurred when a black indentured servant named John Punch objected to mistreatment, leaving service with two white servants. Upon being apprehended and returned to their master, the white servants had their terms extended, while Punch was condemned to lifelong servitude. This event is often considered the beginning of institutionalized slavery in the English colonies. Virginia Colony enacted laws restricting the rights of Africans after 1640, particularly during the 1660s when slavery became fully institutionalized. While Jamestown and the Virginia colonies unfolded to the south, the New England colonies were taking shape, Plymouth Colony emerged in 1620, 
followed by Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630, and other New England colonies sprouted from there. Native American enslavement became notable after the Pequot War, with defeated natives sold as slaves to West Indies plantations. Massachusetts Bay Colony enacted the first slavery laws in 1641, justifying enslavement for those captured in war, convicted of a crime, or sold to colonists as foreigners already enslaved. Although New England and the Middle Colonies aren't typically associated with slavery, they did engage in varying degrees of it. By 1703, New York City's slave population comprised 42%, and a slave market operated on Wall Street. Massachusetts Bay led the way in profiting from the slave trade, initially by shipping salted fish to West Indies plantations, and later importing Africans as slaves to be sold in New England markets. While legally justified, this practice overlooked its role in encouraging the triangle trade and the increasing enslavement and transport of Africans. A triangular trade route connected Europe, West Africa, and the Americas, laying the foundation for the infamous transatlantic slave trade. This cycle facilitated the exchange of goods and human lives. Colonists sent raw goods to Britain, where they were transformed into finished products and traded with West Africa. In return, slaves were shipped to the English colonies. The unfortunate souls who found themselves ensnared in this web of commerce endured the harrowing Middle Passage, a treacherous journey from Africa to North America. Packed below decks like cargo, these individuals faced unimaginable conditions, with over half expected to perish before reaching their destination. Scholar Oscar Rice delves into the grim reality, estimating that of the 18 million Africans who left during this period, around 6 million met their tragic end during the journey. The cramped, squalid conditions aboard the slave ships were beyond comprehension. Forced to lie spoon fashion on their sides to conserve space, men, women and children were allotted meager dimensions. Lord Palmerston noted that their quarters were even more confined than a corpse in a coffin. The British Parliament attempted to regulate the overcrowding, limiting the number of slaves to five per three-ton capacity in a 200-ton ship. However, such laws were often flouted by the ship captains. Darkness prevailed below decks, with men, women, and boys segregated, and only the men in chains. In fair weather, slaves were brought to the deck, chained to prevent any desperate escape attempts. Left with minimal water and insufficient facilities, their suffering continued. The Middle Passage earned its name as the second leg of the triangular trade, connecting Europe, Africa, and the Americas in a tragic saga. As the triangle trade thrived from the 16th to the mid-19th century, the majority of the slaves brought to North America found themselves in the southern colonies. The southern states, particularly influenced by the English colony of Barbados, developed strict slave laws to maintain control. Alan Taylor highlights the Barbadian Slave Code, established in 1661, which became a model for other English colonies. Slavery in the southern colonies mirrored the harsh system of Barbados, with laws prohibiting slaves from leaving plantations without written permission, restricting their activities, and incentivizing informants. This system aimed to suppress any potential uprising, fueled by the planters' fear of rebellion. In spite of the psychological, social, and demographic costs incurred, the southern colonies adopted and enforced strict measures. The fear of rebellion stemmed not only from the dehumanization of the black population, but also from the memory of past uprisings. The Gloucester County Conspiracy of 1663 and Bacon's Rebellion of 1676, uniting black and white indentured servants and slaves, heightened anxiety. Repressive measures in the southern colonies included hanging or burning slaves accused of fomenting rebellion, driven by the haunting fear of an African majority rising against their oppressors. Despite these oppressive conditions, resistance was not extinguished. The Stono Rebellion of 1739 in South Carolina stands as a testament to the indomitable spirit of those yearning for freedom. Led by a slave named Jimmy, this uprising sought refuge in Spanish Street, Augustine, Florida. The rebellion claimed the lives of both black and white individuals, leaving an indelible mark on the turbulent history of slavery in the 13 colonies. As the echoes of war reverberated across the American colonies in 1775, the hopes of many slaves soared. The words of liberty and justice and the promises of an end to oppression uttered by white masters fueled dreams of freedom. Some black slaves, driven by this optimism, took up arms in the Continental Army, hoping to secure their liberty in exchange for their service. Yet, when the dust settled and the war drew to a close, the shackles of slavery still bound them. 
In the aftermath of the American War of Independence, a contradiction lingered in the air. The ideals of liberty, championed during the conflict, seemed to elude the very people who had fought and toiled for them. Although some black slaves were granted freedom as a reward for their wartime service, the institution of slavery persisted in the colonies. Change, however, gradually swept through the northern colonies. By 1850, both the New England and Middle colonies abolished slavery. The growing abolitionist movement, coupled with the fact that the northern economy was less reliant on slave labor, contributed to this shift. The wheels of progress turned as industrialization diminished the need for human bondage in the north. In the southern colonies, the tendrils of the peculiar institution continued to entwine society. The southern way of life, deeply rooted in slave labor, resisted change. It wasn't until the conclusion of the American Civil War in 1865, a conflict that shattered the Confederate dream, that the southern states were compelled to abandon the chains of slavery. The 13th Amendment, a beacon of hope, finally extinguished the legal existence of slavery in the United States and proclaimed the emancipation of the slaves. Yet, the legacy of slavery cast a long and dark shadow. The systemic racism ingrained in society did not dissipate with the stroke of a pen. While the legal chains were broken, the struggle for true equality persisted. African Americans in the United States found themselves navigating a different America, one far removed from the idealized land of the free and the home of the brave. The haunting specter of racialized slavery endured, manifesting in unequal access to medical care, limited opportunities, and disparities in the administration of justice. The descendants of those who were brought as slaves to the colonies faced an ongoing journey towards realizing the promise of freedom for all in a nation that proclaimed it at its very founding.